Does high drama take the high road or the low road? I just saw two shows at the public. Bruce Norris is a low road, much like Tom Jones follows a pernicious fellow, Jim Truitt, on an epic tale of greed, Ponzi schemes, and heritage in the 1700s. Is he related to George Washington? However, in Tom's case, he was just a boozing womanizer and not after people's money. The entire epic is narrated by Adam Smith, who sets a young protagonist out on his quest for money, position, and power by his writings. Another exciting subplot we follow is John Blake, an Afri a Jama African American, who uh, an African who, or Jamaican. Anyway, he's black. Who was stolen from his land to become a slave, but instead ends up the ward of a wealthy English lord and is incensed when he is built out of his inheritance. But things go awry when he finds himself forced to be a slave in America. Jim Truett buys him, and the two stories now intertwine with lots of adventures and pitfalls. This is a roisterous tale with a flamboyant cast to wit and match wit. There was only one misstep in the beginning of Act 2 when we are taken out of the story for to me no good reason, and it broke the rhythm. It also came to an end rather abruptly, but that is because I never wanted it to end. I enjoyed the company of these characters and actors so much that I haven't felt this transport since Nicholas Nickleby. Emily Rebold's period costumes were stunning, and David Korn's scent was transfixing. I give this a happy face, minus much more on Facebook. In Sarah Burgess's King, three political savvy people against newcomer war widow who just won a special election become a cat and mouse political game amongst lobbyists and political animals against a neophyte who stumbles into their midst who thinks she can escape their mechanizations. What would happen to Mr. Smith if he came to Washington today? Quite frankly, I don't understand politics, and this play was not very helpful. It had something to do with opiates, war widows, first women of color elected in the district, private equity, and some important vote, some behind-the-scenes group called Freedom Strong that controls everything. This is one of those plays where I just enjoy the acting and the characters and don't try and make sense of it. Too bad Alfie didn't see this, as he is studying finance, and he would understand all this stuff. So this is a mixed face for me, but more political savvy people will probably get a kick out of this. Escape to Margaritaville by George Garcia and Mike O'Malley. That's exactly what, what the title said. That's what the show is. It's very for much for tourists. You know, it's like a Caribbean kind of like resort where tourists come for a week. Uh, every week new people come and then this guy he's a musician Paul Alexander Nolan and he's just very easy very cool kind of person plays guitar and everything entertain the tourists and then he has a relationship with them just for one week you know with the women with the women of course <laughs> and he's very happy about it just very casual he's a beach and, bum yeah and there's a bartender who seems very goofy and kind of silly stupid maybe but he's not he has the heart of a like a gem kind of a heart very nice guy and proprietor she's like the caribbean i think woman and she is like a, he has a crush the bartender has a crush on her but she doesn't really care for him but but i think they had a previous relationship at all but then one week no no no, the, no the bartender does not have a crush on him there's this other guy there this old oh uh, yes, yes i'm sorry yeah yes. there's another guy yes. who has traveled all over the world and he's got and he's got a yes, treasure yes. he's got a treasure buried on this thing and he's in love with the proprietor yeah, but she, of this uh hotel the whole town but she had some fling with him in the past but she's not interested any longer no so but then so, this yeah. This new group shows up, and there's a lady named Rachel, who's played by Alison uh, Alison uh, Luff, and she's very serious and scientist. She's doing a project which is dealing with potatoes, like yeah, po <laughs> the po po powering with potatoes. You know, when you're a kid, you do this whole thing with powering potatoes, and yeah. she wants to make a superpower potato. Yes, yeah, superpower potato, potato, potato power. Very thing. serious about but, it. But the thing know? is, the reason they are there in this island is because her best friend uh, is getting married to this complete no good Nick. I mean, he's just all he cares about is sports. He's a selfish son of a bee. And he wants her to lose weight, otherwise he cannot love her. You know, because well, yes. <laughs> but we, whatever, right? whatever. But so she comes there for that, you know. Yeah, and, and she's hoping that that she wants her friend to. Die dump him so she encourages her to have a fling with the bartender right so that's the romantic interest here the bartender, bartender and, the, and yeah and, and the there are three kind me. of relationships going on you know so this guy uh, alexander nolan he's very much like he's very fascinated by rachel you know 
and Rachel is fascinated by him too, but she's so serious about her science project that she doesn't want to have any, any commitment, fun. you know. No, no, or any they fun. Have, but they end up having sex anyway, well, yeah, right? But, but I mean, we've yeah. we given okay. enough of the way it's right. right. Uh, it's such, just, such as it is, basically, the whole point of this entire thing is to listen to Jimmy Buffett music. Exactly. And yeah. I guess, I mean, I just know Margaritaville. That's the only song I know from him. But I guess his fans are called Parrot Heads. And so there's all these Parrot Heads. And, they, and you get to drink tequila. I mean, this really is not a Broadway show, but like a party. It really is. Yeah. There's beach balls that come down at the end. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of stupid, fun, ridiculous plot. Who cares? It's like, it's, and it's, it's like a Shakespeare play with, it's where, they, actually, that's where they pair everybody together. At that's the exactly what it is. That's what tourists do and they really have a good time, you know? But then the, the thing, I want, I love one sequence only. The rest was all silly. Where all these insurance people, the ghost of the insurance oh, yeah, people, yeah. they do a tap dance. Yes. It was just so <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The bartender keeps getting, getting these drug flashbacks. And they all deal with insurance agents. For some I mean, there's a but, pun on insurance agents. They're horrible, right? But we should but, mention the choreography because that was a really good number. Kelly Devine did this divine choreography with tap dancing. I mean, they had to put a production number in there somehow. Like I say, this is the goofiest, stupidest, fun yeah. thing. Really, it's just, it's you know what it is? It's like trashy summer reading. It really is. It it's, really is. It's like, and everything works out at the end also, you know, like every romance is perfect. Of that because I like the sequence of the insurance people, you know, I just give a mix, but it wasn't and, such a good show. And because the critics have been so harsh against this really bauble, I'm gonna give it a happy face minus. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, it's, yeah mixed, it's understandable, but we, I mean, look, it's a mixed Mean is the most serious person in the world, and she even had a good time. So, see, no, I had a good, I mean, I love that sequence, I yeah, told you there see, too. I was yeah, like, I loved it. I mean, people, it was serious minded <laughs> people can enjoy this. First of all, I hate the insurance people anyway, so I just really really loved it. They're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> and now for a couple of plays I saw at 59's 59th Street. Max Baker's Hal and B is a real head scratcher. This old hippie married couple have murderous thoughts. It's like he wants to keep the audience on their toes by not knowing what's real and what is fantasy, but it gets tiresome after a while and it accomplishes nothing. Something is alluded to about it all changing when their daughter was born, but this is never fully explored or explained. I love Brian Dujakis' set and Genevieve V. Beller's costumes. I wanted Candy Buckley's shoes. In fact, that's why I was there in the first place. I like her. She's a fantastic actress. In fact, the acting was great. The play wasn't. He's a much better actor than he is a playwright. You can see him in the low road. He's wonderful there. Only two things I liked about this. Uh, he didn't want her to cut off the cable bill because he needed to watch the mess game. Same here. And her daughter, their daughter kept calling them dude. I am not a dude. That is, I'm honestly saying that to Alfie. So that part I could appreciate, but the rest of it, the play was just nah. Hannah Moscovich's Old Stock, A Refugee Love Story, is the story of how her great-great-grandparents got together in 1908 after fleeing pogroms and hoping for a better life in Canada. Uh, Chaim and Chaim meet in line where they were separated from the others because he has a rash and she has a cough. They have harrowing tales to tell and life can be just as anti-Semitic in Canada as the rest of the world, which surprised me. The story was periodically interrupted by the, the Wanderer. He was a narrator with klezmer songs that really didn't relate to the story. It was nice music, though. The opening reminded me of David Malloy, so I was really thought I was going to relish this. Look, I'm not a prude. I can curse a blue streak. But the Wanderer's profanity-infused dialogue was disconcerting and abruptly brought us back to the present. It interrupted the flow of the story, which I was quite taken with, and I found the litany of ways to describe having sex unnecessary, and it went on too long. The musicians were excellent, but they tended to drown out the discourse, and the actors did a fine job. And uh, the set design was very intriguing, as is the storage container that opened up into the set. And also, the love story was very strange, because he's like 19, she's 24, and she's so mean to him. It's like, why, why is he bothering with her? So, I'm giving this a mix, but it has potential to be good if they just stop, keep it in 19 away, don't change the tone of the piece. Tact is presenting at Theatre Row, Three Wise Guys, written by Scott Allen Evans and Jeffrey Couchman, 
and it's based on two Damon Runyon stories, both Christmas stories, Dancing Dan's Christmas and Three Wise Guys. Christmas 1932 is a time for wild adventures and new beginnings um, in these plays. Dancing Dan, dressed in a Santa suit, is able to avoid being killed by Heine Schmitz in Good Time Charlie's Bar. He and his cohorts, the Dutchman and Blondie Swanson, find themselves entertaining the high society guests and delinquent boys at Bitsy Albright's ritzy Long Island party. Will Dancing Dan be able to prove his love for Muriel O'Neill? And will Blondie become a white knight for his lady, Miss Clarabelle Cobb? Can miracles happen on Christmas Eve? It's wonderful to hear these guys delivering uh, Runyon's elegant, elevated gangster ease. And it's great stories, too. I love Damon Runyon. I have loved Damon Runyon since Little Miss Marker and Lemon Drop Kid and Pocket Full of Miracles, Lady of Day. I mean, I, I just, I'm obsessed with Damon Runyon. I love reading him. I love seeing them. I turn him into a play, musical movie, whatever. I am so there. And Miss, and he covered, well, Mr. Runyon covered the senior side of Broadway with very lovable gangsters, criminals, gamblers, and the broads that pine for them. Women try to score marriage with the white picket fence, while the guys try to fence mer merchandise to bet on the horses and score big time. The actors capture the essence of these characters with their exaggerated grammar and polite forbearance. Scott Allen Evans directed them with such obvious glee as they careened around the countryside, bumping into silly plot contrivances that made me gasp and giggle. With its Christmas themes of love, forgiveness, compassion, and having good deeds succeed, this was a fitting but sad way to bid farewell to Scott Allen Evans Aww. and Tag. I can't believe, it. just like Mel Miller, he's hanging it up too. I have been with them since they were at the New York Historical Society. Before Roundabout the Time in the Conway, they did it as a stage reading. They started as doing these staged readings of these wonderful plays, and I am going to miss them because they always bring quality work and the best people, and Scott Allen Evans just did, I mean, you know, Simon Jones, Cynthia Dahl, mm -hmm. Cynthia... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great repertoire company, and they'll really be missed. But this particular show is only 80 minutes, and it's a real screwball comedy. It's so fast-paced, so exhilarating. It's a great way to end. It's a great note to end on. Yeah, so um, a, may, a happy, fa again, sad that we are losing a really good company, but happy that they're ending with my all-time favorite, Damon Runyon. Absolute show to see. Isabel Mahone's new play, Party Face, is a soap opera family drama set in Ireland. Molly is throwing a small party for her mother and sister and a new friend she just met. Mom invited Chloe, a neighbor of Molly's, that the mother feels more akin to as they are both pretentious. Tensions mount and secrets are revealed. This is not an earth-shattering play, but to see the fabulous cast with Haley Mills, who I have admired since I was a kid, more than made up for the play's flaws. Haley Mills has real stage presence, and she may have played a despicable character, but in the end she proves she has some redeeming attributes. And Laura De Bruyne's stunning costumes on Jeff Ridenour's spectacular set gave the show a nice gloss, and that food looked very yummy. And Sasha Clark has a lot more to say about this on Facebook, but I think we both give it basically a happy face minus, because the play, eh, but Clea Blackhurst is there in it, and it's comic relief, and it's a good cast, and you get to see Ailey Mills. I mean, you can't get more scathingly brilliant than that. Keen Company is presenting at Theater Row another party play, Later Life by A.R. Gurney. Boston hostess Sally places Austin and Ruth on her terrace overlooking the harbor so they can reminisce about the past and contemplate possibilities for the future. Boston-based Austin has had a safe, privileged life. Groton, Harvard, great bank job, marriage, divorce, and successful children. Ruth has been more of a risk-taker, including marrying twice the Las Vegas gambler she's now separated from. The attraction between Austin and Ruth was strong many years ago when they first met on Capri and seems equally strong now, but will they actually mate? 
While I was watching this, I felt like I was revisiting Ava Gurney's love letters, which even shared the same initials, LL. Will the uptight privileged man finally get the happy ever after with the free wild spirit woman? Unlike Mark, I welcome the intrusion of the party guests, as it is a bit unrealistic to think that there are only two people and a hostess at the party. Well, I didn't mind it because it's not realistic. I just thought it was tiresome to see one eccentric guest after another. No, it no, was no. a parade of eccentricity that I could have done without. To me, they added more dimension to the love lost and found story with their own relationships and small talk and banter. Jonathan Silverstein has done a splendid job of taking this astounding cast and making this gossamer confection that I just gobbled up. Well, I enjoyed the two almost lovers very much. The rest of it, not as thrilled with, but I'd still give it a happy face minus because it's a wonderful production with great acting. Well, I just loved it. I'm giving it a major happy face. Oh, sorry. That, <laughs> uh, that, that sad face was his. Absolutely happy. Yeah. We both liked it, basically. There's a great one-woman show at here, Shakespeare's Will, written by Vern Thiessen, directed by Mimi McGurl, and performed um, by Tannis Kowalczyk as Anne Hathaway. Shakespeare's Will takes place on the day of William Shakespeare's funeral. His widow, Anne Hathaway, presents her story as she awaits her husband's bitchy sister, Joan, to come and discuss the will. We learn about their unusual marriage and both were free to have lovers. Anne tells us about her husband's special relationship with the male companion, as well as her many male lovers. I'm not sure how much of this is historically accurate, but it's extremely absorbing. We also learn about their children, Susanna, Judith, and Hamnet. Ms. Kowalczyk is a very accomplished performer, capable of reciting poetry, singing, and telling body anecdotes with equal ease. The writing of this piece is also extremely fine, especially in its incorporation of water imagery. I suspect that those who know a great deal about Shakespeare will find much to learn and enjoy, as well as a great deal to think about. I normally don't like one-person shows, but this is a major exception. Real happy face for this. For someone who has loved the Spongebob cartoon since it first came out, this musical was sheer delight from Bikini Bottom Day to its final reprise. And it's just not another day at Bikini Bottom. Oh, no, no. A volcano is due to erupt in over 24 hours and eviscerate the beloved town. What to do? Patrick's solution is just to close your eyes so you can't see it. The sardines consider Patrick's suggestion genius and follow him as their new hero, which is very intoxicating for him. SpongeBob, the irrepressible optimist, knows he can save the day and become manager of Krusty Krab despite Mr. Krab's lack of confidence. Sandy is sure she can use science to save the day, but the town is ganging up on her as she is different from them, being a land dweller. Squidward just wants to play his clarinet at the opening of the fundraiser to save Bikini Bottom. Plankton, of course, is using this present-day catastrophe to plot with his computer wife Karen to take over the feeding habits and minds of the citizens. Yeah, this was so much fun. I actually expected it to be really, really bad, but the dancing's great, the music is great, Squidward does this incredible four-leg um, tap dance number. Gavin Creel. Gavin wow. Creel, right? He does it all across the stage with some, uh, with, I don't know how to pronounce it, enemies, but dancing in enemies, something like that. And Christopher Cattelli did the choreography. Right. He was really good at that. I got home. I still have songs on my phone that I listen to all the time. <laughs> so this is just a delight for everybody. Yeah. Uh Talk about. The thing is, you have to understand about helping me. Since he was little, we would we didn't have cable, so we would go to my mom's and my sisters and watch SpongeBob there, yeah. and we'd always get yelled at. We actually got into trouble for watching SpongeBob, and the people in the audience treated this like it was a rock concert. Yeah, you were hysterical because the the woman next to your mom was screaming the entire time, woo woo, <laughs> shouting, yelling for Squidward, clapping. I thought my mom's ear was gonna fall off, but everyone was. Really Really getting into it. It was a, it was really like a giant party for SpongeBob fans. Uh, not just even that, you know. Because, <coughs> you know, he, honest to be, the critics 
are going for That's this true. too. I, I I think it's because Tina Landau, who you'd never think as a director for this, because she is a rather serious person, but sure. I guess she's got a really crazy side to her, and we get to see it in this. Oh my God, the whole thing, and it's a, and they they're all over the stage. They really get you in. You know, they come into the audience. This was yeah. just, this was so spectacular. And all, all the songs are written by different people. Oh, like yeah, right. Aerosmith, and uh, there's a song, um, the people who wrote um, the Malcolm in the Middle theme song, There Might Be Giants, they they, they did a song. Um, uh, uh, who am I? John Legend, Cindy, Cindy Lauper, Lady Antebellum, They yeah. Might Be Giants. There's even David Bowie and uh, uh, songs. Yeah, I David mean, Bowie has a song. That, that one's cool. It right. was really cool. You got a yeah. bunch of people. Yeah, I mean, this is just a delight. Yeah, this was great. This is from Bob Creaso. On Facebook, he has a rather long review of Perrins and also an interview with the playwright Christopher Green. Uh, this is co-directed by Christopher Green and Holly Race Rogham, and it's part of Guggenheim Museum's Work in Progress series, and it takes place in the cafeteria part of the Guggenheim Museum. It's supposedly like a support group for porn addicts. And there's a mixture of actors and real audience members who get to talk and share their porn addiction stories. Um, so there's a lot of laughs that are both planned and spontaneous. Um, and let's see, what else? He wanted to, uh, the writer wanted to stage the least theatrical thing ever. So there's no stage, no set, no special lighting just a circle in a white room, which is the right restaurant in the Guggenheim Museum. It seems like uh, Bob liked it a lot, and again, there's much more on Facebook, and it seems like an interesting concept. So I'm assuming he's giving it a happy face. For the new group is David Rabe's Good for Otto, which takes place in a bucolic setting for a mental health facility run by Dr. Michaels and Evangeline with a collection of troubled souls that are mostly concerned with parental children issues, aging and feeling what's the use of getting out of bed, spectrum, spe sexual orientation, and overactive imagination. While Dr. Michaels is dealing with these patients and battling the bureaucratic, unfeeling insurance agent, he is also dealing with his dead mom who haunts his thoughts and actions. Interrupting his thoughts further is his imagination of trying to put all the diverse clients together to sing old-timey songs like, On Moonlight Bay. David Rabe has written a profound play about the problems of being human, and the cast has infused these compelling characters with such empathetic qualities that I was enthralled the entire time. An amazing cast, a really good play. I don't normally like David Rabe, but this is so good. This is Mark Savitt's review of The Winter's Tale. Shakespeare's tragic comedy of jealousy and miraculous redemption is brilliantly presented by theater for a new audience. While all the action takes place on a spare white set, the gorgeous lighting and falling snow and leaves keep this production from feeling minimal. The uh, costumes are also quite lush. While this comes closer to tragedy than almost any other comedy, the clowns provide genuine mirth. The shepherd rubes John Keating and Ed Malone are marvelous, and Wiley Thief Autocolis, as played by Arnie Burton, is priceless. This made me feel I had witnessed one of the best plays ever written. He gives this an absolute happy face. And now where you can find the shows that we talked about. And talked about in past shows. Um, we really wanted to see this. I was supposed to see my brilliant divorce of Melissa Gilbert, but it was canceled because of the snowstorm. And Cruel Intentions is now closing on April 8th. And you can see the review on the Facebook page I saw ages ago. Bye, Tack. Snip, snip. We'll talk more about Winter's Tale on our next show, April 14th. And we'll talk about Amy and the Orphans on our next show, April 14th. I forgot to mention that Escape to Margaritaville and SpongeBob both feature volcanoes. 
And you know that that song that I know so well. You know, oh, you know, last. I always thought it was last jigger of salt, but it's a lost shake of salt, and it's really funny the way it's used. And check out Feinstein's. There's just too much going on for me to tell you about it. All these places. Just go to the website because you'll find wonderful surprises. And the musical, musicals, the musical, which was such a hit at the York 15 years ago, is back for a special event on Monday, April 9th at 6.30. And it's uh, they take a scene and do it in different styles like Sondheim and and Mamet and Rogers and Hammerstein. It's brilliant. Go see that. And next at Children's Theater is Airplay. And you can see my review of Black Beauty, which closed. And a couple of really good plays going on at the Irish Rep. Three small mm -hmm. Irish masterpieces. One of them features Ings' Rider to the Sea. Lots going on at the Avon's Art Center. Mm -hmm. Let me look at all. And Eliza Bent has ha got her show coming up. And Dutch Masters is uh, looks really interesting. We're going to go see that. That closes April 21st. That we'll talk about on our next show. And we are a masterpiece at 14th Street Y Theater. We'll talk about it on the next show. And Symphony Fantastique is at uh, here, and Jeremy Irons is at 92nd Street Y, and Charlie Bush, Charles Bush is going to be at Theater for the New City, and Nikki in Springtime is going to be at La Mama, and great stuff at The Brick, and coming to, to BAM is Anthony Schur and King Lear. And at The Flea, you've got the Q Brothers that have brought you in the past the Bombardier of Errors, is doing Ms. Estrada and Locked Up Bitches. And Amy and the Orphans will talk about it on our next show. And Charles Atlas is going to be at the kitchen on May 12th. And I'm going to go see the squad, Gob Squad at um, March 29th. So you'll just see the review on the Facebook page at the Skirball Center. I, I haven't been there in ages. And Little Buck, you might remember from So You Think You Can Dance, is going to be at the Skirball Center. And coming up... Uh, we got the lucky ones with the Bengsons, and oh my God, this Pygmalion, it's brilliant the way Bedlam has conceived it. I'll talk about it in the next show, but Eliza is from, is of Indian extraction, and it just makes it so much, it's just brilliantly staged and inventive. Playwrights Horizon has this flat earth, and I went to the opening of the Stone Witch, and on our next show we'll have interviews and all sorts of cool stuff from them. And these are all the reviews that closed before we could talk about them. So go to our Facebook page and uh, read about Molly Pope and Folk Wanderings and everything else. And Parody Productions, these are the shows that they recommend. And don't forget to pick up your Performing Arts Insider, the Cultural Heartbeat of New York City. Our next show is April 14th. And don't forget to go to our Facebook page. And you can go to YouTube. If you go to Eva Heinemann on YouTube, you can see the whole show there.